All right, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, uh, my name is Mark Gillarducci. I'm the director of the Governor's Office of Emergency Services. Um, today, we have uh, the governor here and a number of our public safety leaders uh, to really talk about a number of things that we are continuing to do to enhance preparedness and public safety uh, throughout the state. You know, let me start by framing the fact that um, in the last few years, we have seen increasingly complex and extreme disasters that have resulted in significant amount of damage and destruction and loss of lives. 2018 alone, starting at the beginning of the year with the mudslides that occurred in Montecito in Santa Barbara County as a result of the Thomas fire following the 2017 fires, uh, all the way through 2018 with a number of fires um, and in the north ending with the campfire, which we all know uh, in Paradise uh, was destructive for the entire town. In all in 2018, we had more than 23,000 structures lost and almost over 100 fatalities. This is a very serious situation and we are continuing to work collectively and collaboratively to be able to address it uh, throughout our state. And there are a number of initiatives that we're going to talk about today and, and, uh, and Governor Newsom is going to brief us on. Um, uh, but before the governor, I'm, I'm going to have uh, our public safety partners that, that, that help manage at the state level working with our local governments. Our local government, fire, law enforcement, the sheriffs, um, uh, our emergency managers are an integral component to our overall mutual aid system and our preparedness system in making sure our communities are as safe and resilient as possible. And it's important that we note that the public themselves need to continue to get engaged and informed uh, to be as empowered as possible to protect their lives and property when these events happen. Uh, so with that, I'm going to uh, turn it over to our first speaker, um, Tom Porter, who is the acting director of the California Department of Forestry and Fire Protection, CAL FIRE. Uh, thank you, Director Gilarducci. Um, I, I'm here to kind of set the frame, uh, framework for why, it, why Colfax? Uh, what is the significance of Colfax in, in what is a statewide problem? Um, the, there are communities throughout California that are just like Colfax. Uh, there is a fire problem that we have that we have been working to mitigate through uh, forest resilience uh, work, uh, through fuel breaks, through defensible space improvements, and uh, all that goes along with that pre-fire element of, of wildfires. So Colfax sits, as many other communities, including Auburn, Dutch Flat, uh, on the rim of the North Fork of the American River. North Fork of the American River in this part of the state is uh, a source of most of the large damaging fires that happen here. And putting fuel breaks and uh, fuel uh, and forest resilience kind of programs along the, below the rim and along the, the rim near the communities is one way of reducing the intensity of fires and uh, increasing the capability of firefighters to protect the communities. Uh, unfortunately, last year, the campfire really gave us a test and a uh, understanding that the, the traditional methods that we've used are not working. We have to do more. And this governor, Governor Newsom, is going to be sure that we do so and has promised uh, to support uh, our departments, all of us behind me, in making sure that happens. Uh, that is the, the relevance of why we're in Colfax, and uh, it's very important that, that we understand that this is a statewide problem. Thank you. Commissioner Stanley. Thank you, Tom. And I just like to talk about the interagency aspect of dealing with these fires. They're so big, they're so large, and they can go on for a long time. And from a law enforcement perspective, there's so much law enforcement that is needed. The CHP and the National Guard, we can come in, we provide assistance to the Sheriff's Department or the Police Department to help manage the fire so we can mitigate it 
and hopefully as soon as possible get people back in their homes once the fire has been mitigated. And the ways that we help out are with traffic control, uh, security, general law enforcement. And one thing that was always so, so very important, when people have to evacuate their homes and go to a shelter, they're concerned about the things that are left there and at home. And the, one of the things that we help, with, help out with, with the Sheriff's Department or the Police Department, is uh, patrolling for looters. And there was some of that going on in the campfire, and we were very happy and proud to assist with that and get those people off the streets. And from that perspective, I, I want to say thank you uh, to Governor Newsom for having the faith in the four of us here, myself, Mark Gilarducci, Tom Porter, and General Baldwin. We've been working together for the last couple of years, especially uh, we've had so many fires since 2017. And we make a great team. We work hard together. We have a lot of fun. But we understand what's going on, and we're able to bring in our resource, resources uh, to help mitigate these fires and uh, maintain public safety. So with that, I'll turn it over to uh, General Baldwin. Thanks, Warren. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. The California National Guard has global commitments. Uh, indeed, in the last two years, we've had soldiers and, de and airmen deployed to all seven continents around the world. But for the National Guard, job one for us is here at home, protecting lives and property at the direction of the governor. And the last few years, as uh, Tom Porter and Mark Gilarducci discussed, have been especially challenging as we've seen this tremendous uptick in the number of very large-scale disasters, mainly fires. As a result, all of us within the interagency that's responsible for public safety have had to evolve the way that we do business. Governor Newsom, when he first came in here, and effectively the first day on his job, has directed that we continue to innovate and leverage technology, and specifically for the military department, how can we better use military technologies in order to help our allied fire and law enforcement agencies protect lives and property here in the state? Now, we've been innovative in the past with unmanned systems, but now we're exploring, and at the direction of the governor, we're going to continue to explore ways that we can enhance our ground-based sensors, other aerial platforms, and even space-based systems so that we can provide notice and warning to people in real time and to be able to support those out there on the line fighting the fires or responding to disasters with that technology. Some of that change is not merely technological application, but we also have to challenge some of the firewalls and systems that exist back in the Pentagon and back uh, in Washington, D.C., where there's rules that limit our access and our ability to leverage and use these systems. In the use of unmanned systems, for example, in order for us to fly our Reaper aircraft in order to uh, support CAL FIRE, we have to go back to the Secretary of Defense, who personally has to give us permission to do that. That process can take hours or in some cases even days or weeks. During an emergency, we don't have hours. We need to be able to respond immediately. So those are the kind of rules and, and old ways of doing business that we want to break down. At the heart of innovation is, must be a willingness to change and a willingness to, to, to take on old ways of doing business and come up with better ways of biz, doing business in order for us to respond collectively and collaboratively and with a synergistic effect across the interagency. Governor Newsom has directed us to do that, and all four of the leaders that stand before you are poised and have already been talking very excitedly about ways that we're going to work better together, break down stovepipes between our various agencies, and work collaboratively in the, in the interest of the people of California. With that, I'll be followed by our Commander-in-Chief, Governor Newsom. Thank you, General. Thank you uh, to uh, all of you for being here, and, and uh, I'm very pleased to be in Placer County, up here in Colfax. I, I spent a good deal of my life uh, just up the road in Dutch Flat, where we have a home, and down the road uh, where my father was uh, on the, uh, the Superior Court, where I was, Jennifer, small enough that I fit in that statue where the gold pan is. I was actually physically in the gold pan. I, I don't think I can fit in it anymore, but that gives you a sense of uh, my history in this part of the state. Uh, and I am happy to be back here on my first day at work uh, to make uh, a symbolic and substantive point uh, that I place no greater uh, emphasis and energy and sense of urgency than on the issue of public safety, broadly defined, and in particular, the issues of emergency preparedness. Uh, I don't know what more evidence one needed than having gotten th gone through an election only to wake up the next morning uh, to face not only two fires, one uh, 
up here in the northern part of the state, one in the southern part of the state, but also a tragic shooting uh, down in Southern California. I was, as you may recall, in my acting governor capacity as lieutenant governor, as the governor had left the state, and it only underscored and reinforced the imperative uh, that I place on making sure this state is more resilient and more prepared uh, for natural and man-made disasters. Look, it goes without saying the hots are getting hotter, the dries are getting drier, the wets are getting wetter. You may call it climate change, you may call it global warming, someone called it global weirding to me the other day. Uh, someone at the Monta Vista Inn, when we were playing liar's dice the other day, said to me, I don't care what you call it, uh, he says, something ain't right. And the fact is, the climate's changing, and we need to change with it. Uh, we still have organized so much of the bureaucracy of government uh, around a world that no longer exists, around a fire season that no longer exists. Uh, we staff up, we staff down, uh, and now we're reacting to these old mores, and that fundamentally has to change. In the last few years, I think substantive progress has been made in the state of California. The legislature and former Governor Brown, I, I, did think, I think, did a very good job in the last few years uh, leaning into these issues, but it's clear to me a lot more needs to be done. Uh, you will see uh, that demonstrably um, uh, recognized with our budget that I'll be releasing later this week. We will place an historic investment uh, in our emergency planning and emergency preparation in this state. We will put over $200 million, not just the $200 million that was announced last year on the cap and trade to deal with forest health and address some of the need to thin our forests and make sure they're more resilient. Uh, we will place even more resources than that baseline. We will uh, invest uh, in pre-positioning in ways we haven't in the past with uh, more uh, support, local level, more mutual aid. Uh, we will invest the general said, and more technology, more camera technology, uh, more strategies to access data, data satellite data, uh, and partner with our federal government uh, on other technology that exists that frankly hasn't been utilized in the past. Uh, we will make sure uh, that we resource uh, as well uh, our efforts uh, to focus on alert systems, uh, to build on some of the legislative efforts there. Uh, not just with the federal overlays with the WEA program, uh, but some of the local strategies uh, and the issues related to opting in to those alert systems versus opting out. Uh, we are going to lay out a strategy and a framework to make sure there's more consistency in the 58 counties in the state and the 470 plus cities uh, that represent this state. Over $305 million uh, will be invested in this space uh, of additional resources, including $109 million uh, to continue our investments uh, in new technology on suppression, specifically as it relates to these Black Hawk helicopters that will be retrofitted uh, for water uh, uh, efforts and for fire suppression. We will continue to make uh, investments in our C-130s uh, and make sure that CAL FIRE has a fleet of these retrofitted C-130s. Uh, one will be rolling out formally into our possession, even though we have access to a number of these C-130s, uh, we have a goal of getting seven additional uh, units over the course of the next few years. So new equipment, historic investment, new strategies to pre-deploy pre uh, resources and assets, uh, historic amount of money uh, to address the need to uh, invest in our forests to make them healthier uh, and to make sure that they're more resilient uh, and always an emphasis of supporting local government. And you'll see that also reflected in that budget uh, with grants uh, and with support uh, to localize solutions uh, as each and every part of the state requires unique and distinctive strategies to address the broader issues of emergency preparedness. In addition, uh, and I know we're here talking about wildfires. In addition, uh, we will also be making the final capital investment of $16.3 million into our early warning, uh, earthquake early warning system, uh, which uh, is something I've been eager to see happen for years and years. Uh, this final investment will complete our sensors uh, all over the state, and then we'll have to 
figure out strategies to make sure that we operationalize. You may know Los Angeles did a version of what we want to do statewide. Uh, we're going to build on some of the work they've done and make sure that every part of the state has the benefit of that early warning system as well. So uh, broad strokes, we are stepping up our game. Uh, I, I hear you. I get it. Uh, we need to do more and do better. Uh, these last two years have been devastating. 167 lives have been lost in fires or floods. Uh, over 33,000 structures, if you look back over a 24-month period, have been lost in this state. Billions and billions of dollars uh, of property losses. And uh, we are at a point where everybody's had enough. And we need to, I think, make sure we are prepared more than ever for the next few months uh, as we enter into the height of our fire season. So that's the spirit uh, of why we're here. Let me be specific about three additional things uh, and then obviously open up to any questions and I can flesh out any of the details on the budget if you'd like as well. Uh, and that is today I signed two executive orders. Um, one, prioritizing a different strategy to address where we begin to make our investments uh, and the strategy is a little different than we've seen in the past. I want to use science in a way we haven't, and I also want to address the issue of social mobility in a way we haven't. It's crystal clear to me that the two need to twin. We need to know what parts of this state are most at risk for disasters, for emergencies, for wildfires, but not just at risk from a fuels perspective, uh, and a property damage perspective, but also from the perspective of mobility and lives, socioeconomic considerations, seniors, uh, people that don't have the mobility many others have, folks that don't have the resources that others have, and begin to overlay those two things in a way that then will allow us to more, I think, strategically prioritize where our first investments are made. Uh, I have tasked the folks behind me uh, including the no longer acting director of CAL FIRE, uh, but now the current and permanent director of CAL FIRE, uh, to come back in 45 days with a report uh, that lays out their priorities. And in that report will also include the legitimate considerations of CEQA and the prospect of creating some programmatic EIRs to allow us to move forward much more expeditiously once we have that prioritization uh, and make sure that we hit the ground running in terms of making sure these dollars are being expended uh, and making sure the communities uh, are uh, being protected. Number two, uh, I have been very frustrated with our procurement in the state of California broadly, particularly as it relates to technology and innovation in this space around emergency preparedness. I don't want to bore you, but we have a world of, you know, sort of jumbled language on RFIs, RFPs, RFQs, um, where, frankly, we are determining solutions, putting these things out over the course of years and years, and eventually some bidders come forward, maybe they don't. Uh, and by the time we actually get some product out, the world's radically changed. And what we've invested in no longer is relevant to the world we're living in. We want to flip that completely on its head. And we found a code section. We've got some fancy lawyers, found some code sections that allow me by executive order. I didn't know I could do it by executive order. This is it's kind of fun being governor. Uh, <laughs> I thought we had to go through this legislative process, but we're just going to do it. We just did it, in fact. I uh, signed this executive order where we're going to come out with this new version uh, uh, called RFI-2, and we had to come up with a name. Basically, it's an innovation model that allows us to iterate in real time and to procure in real time different solutions and to test those solutions in the field before then we go through the procurement process. I want to see things happen in real time, and I want people to compete for that mind share and for uh, that work. And so it's a completely different framework. Again, this, I'm not sure any of you are going to be interested in Nightly News not interested in this, and I'm not sure any of you are going to print this. Uh, but this is, I think, actually a really big deal. Uh, and it, it, it's an encouraging thing that everybody behind me agreed with it and expressed similar frustration 
and hopefully they can be relieved of that frustration as we move in a new direction. And finally, uh, we have also signed a letter because I believe in collaboration, um, and that collaboration extends beyond California. Governor Inslee and Governor Brown of Oregon have signed a letter uh, along with the state of California that we uh, are now sending this afternoon to President Trump and the White House saying, you know what, rather than talking past each other, <laughs> talking down to each other, uh, maybe we can start partnering and doing the work that needs to be done to address our forest health and forest management. Because at the end of the day, California has a de minimis amount of jurisdiction. The vast majority of what you see behind you, what I see in front of us, is federal land. And with all due respect, they've cut their budget by $2 billion in the last few years to make sure that land is healthier. And yet, we're being attacked for not doing our part when, in fact, last year, 49% of the work we did in our forest was actually work for the federal government in their jurisdiction and land. So we put up $111 million since 2017 for forest thinning, and half that was doing the job of the federal government. Now, rather than lamenting about that and, as they say, talking past each other, this is a letter of cooperation and collaboration. Uh, and it's a letter that reconciles the fact that it's hardly unique uh, to California, these issues. They matter greatly to Oregon and Washington State. Uh, and so the three of us uh, will be doing a lot more together. Uh, and this seemed an obvious space for us uh, to work uh, today. And so that's a preview of things. And, uh, and I'm happy to take any questions Governor, you may have. And there's that. <laughs> so we're working on that in real time. I'm not going to make news on that because I'm very sensitive to the things that governors say, uh, particularly as it relates to the markets, particularly as it relates to the magnitude of the challenge, particularly PG&E faces as a utility. We want a healthy utility. We want a utility that's investing in the future, low carbon, green growth strategies. That's in an ideal world. That's not the case today. And so we are, uh, we are addressing that issue in real time. In fact, this morning at 8 a.m., we had a meeting on that exact to topic. Um, and we have a commission, as you know, that the legislature uh, has uh, organized. And we are uh, appointing three members to that commission. Uh, we'll be announcing those appointments in the next few days. Uh, and they will have a very short period of time uh, that they will be tasked to come up with comprehensive recommendations. I'm not just waiting on that commission. We are working collaboratively with members of the PUC, uh, with previous administration, uh, and the folks that I am now bringing into our administration uh, to address the solvency of PG&E. Uh, you spoke about a lot of spending that you were planning on doing. How much of that is new or not, has there been that legislative authority? And what are you a lot of this will be, uh, this, a lot of this is a budget that is part of the new budget uh, that will go through the uh, legislature uh, either to be supported, rejected. Uh, some of it was committed as long-term investments but require annual appropriation, uh, including the cap and trade commitment, which was a $1 billion five-year commitment with a baseline of $200 million a year to invest in forest health. Uh, we're going to actually increase uh, that a little bit because we have, uh, some, we have identified additional projects that we want to move quickly. And then there's 100 plus other million dollars in other areas uh, that are new investments in addition to some of the previous investments that I'll be asking for support from the legislature. Well, uh, you want to go through the list? Let's do it. I happen to have it right here. 305, you're going to see in the budget uh, that I submit, it will show a number of 415.1. I can explain to you the difference, but suffice it to say, for the purposes of what I'll explain to you today, the $305 million figure will include the following items. 
$213.6 million uh, for those fuel reductions and forest health. $64.4 million for what uh, I refer to as surge capacity. This would include the addition of five new Conservation Corps crews, which matter to you because we were just down the road here, uh, and all that that was cleared out was done by the Conservation Corps. Uh, so this, I think, will significantly advantage folks up here in Placer County. We'll also have 13 uh, new engines uh, that we will be investing in, and those engines will be pre-deployed in areas across the state uh, that will be recognized by the work that will be done over the next 45 days uh, as critical, uh, what I would refer to lazily as red flag areas. Uh, we will put in $25 million of additional mutual aid to support local government in their pre-deployment work. We'll put $50 million into a communication strategy. And I, I know this may raise some questions, but it was referenced a moment ago by Mark and others, individuals play a huge role in their own safety. And it is incumbent upon us to organize strategies at the local level, working with county supervisors, working with local representatives, to come up with communication strategies. I, as a former mayor, invested in what we called our neighborhood emergency response strategies. Uh, and we want to make sure that every region in the state is organizing at the grassroots level uh, strategies for evacuation, strategies for emergency preparedness and, and the like. That money will go in that space. This is a big one, and I'm glad you asked me to go through this list because I was remiss in not referencing a, an investment in our 911 uh, system. Uh, it is over, long overdue. We have an analog system in a digital world. It is rather remarkable. Uh, that we haven't made this investment in the past. Uh, now, in order to completely shift from the analog into a digital system, it's going to require, I know, I know, a 911 fee. I know. <laughs> I get it. No one's happy when they hear that word, fee. But we think it's appropriate. Uh, the question is, when do we move on the fee? Good people have different opinion. We're going to have to get the legislature to concur on that. But I think this one crosses, you know, Republicans, Democrats alike. I think most folks understand the importance of that. But in the absence of the fee actually taking shape, we put in $10 million this year for upfront capital and $50 million, because I look at things from not just a one-year prism, but from a two-year perspective, $50 million that I want to invest next year. But 10 is all we can spend this year, 50 we could spend next year as the fee ramps up. And it's a 2020, I'm, 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 I'm looking at this, that we get that fee done, ready to go, investments being made on that fee by 2020. But 10 million this year, 50 million next year on the 911 fee. We're gonna have plenty of time. I'm gonna go through four more to get to the other budget items and you're gonna have plenty of time to ask your questions. Just because this may be interesting, a few more of these things. Uh, one of the things that's really important to me is the health and wellness of the men and women behind me. And something that was very indelible when I went down to Ventura, I was up at camp on multiple occasions, fire, was the impact uh, that that fire was having, not just on the individuals in uniform, but their families. And so we're investing in the health and wellness of our first responders as well. And I include that in this budget because it deserves to be included in this budget. That to me is hard money, not soft money. Uh, and that is new money to invest in making sure that we take care of the brain health, not just the physical health of the folks you see behind me. Uh, we're also um, making the investments, as I noted, in new technology on 100 plus new fire cameras, infrared cameras which will be strategically deployed, uh, new remote sensoring technology. Uh, we are going to, as I said, put more investment in retrofitting the C-130s that we're procuring from the Air Force. Uh, and to the extent that it is relevant, and I'll jump in, uh, we're going to make a three-year commitment, which we have never done before, to the folks up in Butte County and the folks in Lake County, because we have not forgotten what happened in 2015, 2016, 2017, 
in 2018 in Lake County. Uh, and that is backfilling their property tax losses. Usually that's done on an annual basis. We're committing to three years for the folks up in Butte and the folks up in Lake County. Uh, and that is tens of millions of dollars uh, to address that concern, as well as making sure that pursuant to Prop 98, we'll backfill the loss uh, of per pupil uh, ADA as it relates to the school district itself. So that's a, a preview uh, of that budget. Yeah, Munich Re came out with a report today showing over $16 billion of insurance losses related to Paradise alone, only $12 billion of it insured. Uh, it also looked at the magnitude worldwide of a world that's radically changing and the insurance risks increasing as consequence premiums around the world, uh, reinsurance challenges, et cetera. So this is along the lines of the PG&E question we just had front and center, top of mind, and is part and parcel of these larger conversations we're having. Again, I've been on the job now 12 hours, uh, and so we're bringing those same folks together on the wildfires, on the utilities. That is also, when I consider those, it's also a proxy for the insurance question as well. Yeah, we spent seven hours. That was a, look, I, I once again, I'll, I'll repeat it. I, I was very uh, gratified that the president took the time to be here. And I was gratified we had the opportunity to spend seven hours dialoguing uh, on this topic and many other topics as well. That's for a book. Uh, <laughs> uh, you can, that, that's off, the, that was a joke. Uh, but, uh, but we did have a chance to talk about that. And, you know, I, I know folks made some light of, about raking what I think the president, it's interesting, I'll send him on that a little bit. I think what he was talking about was defensible spaces, landscaping, which has a role to play. I think that's important. Uh, you know, I, a lot of stuff gets conflated, which is understandable. Uh, but look, he, uh, he's never played politics with disaster declarations, and he deserves credit for that, and we are grateful for that. This is not an area for politics. He hasn't hesitated on any of those disaster declarations from the Orville uh, issue to all these other fires. And, uh, and, and I, I'm pleased as well, Kevin McCarthy's been extraordinary in this space, also getting reimbursements with FEMA. And we had the FEMA director with the president on Marine One, uh, had very intimate conversations on Marine One specific to reimbursements, uh, specific to forest uh, health and management. And that's why the, the letter we sent was honestly in the spirit of collaboration and cooperation in the spirit of that conversation and frankly a follow-up uh, to that conversation now that I am in a position to more formally express myself as the new governor. Oh, and on the other question about where and how we build that the state Yeah, oh, forgive me. Look, uh, as a former mayor, I, I, I recognize the, 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 the stresses that you all face on this topic. The last thing you want is you know, some guy in Sacramento, mayor, telling you what to do in Auburn. That said, you know, you know, if, you know there's a point where, you know, common sense, if it's not prevailing, it's not in evidence, maybe we can lean in a little and encourage and incentivize better behavior, not, you know, discourage bad behavior, but incentivize better behavior, meaning positively engage as opposed to come in punitively. But look, I, that, uh, that whole issue of the interface, the wildland-urban interface, is real. You look at most of the new construction in the last two decades, you look at just driving up here, all the new investment, you know, right down this road, you know, in this area. Um, I, you know, it's a legitimate concern. And so the only way around it to accommodate the housing crisis, which is much worse because of all of these recent fires, is density. Uh, and that's the conversation we're also having in the legislature around what's density look like in big urban settings and how we could provide more density in and around transit corridors, which was a raging debate last year, which actually the AP 
made national issue last year, and that will be also part and parcel of the conversations we have this year, and I think those two are related. Yeah, there's been like, yeah, well, I knew the last seven, they, they keep going, yeah, they disappear. Does that relationship help change any of these conversations you're having? Yeah. Yeah, no, I think it, look, it allows me to pick up the phone because I have the cell phone of some of the executives and have very honest conversations. Um, it allows them to feel more confident with me that they can have honest conversations, and, and we have. During the transition, we had some very sober conversations. I didn't just wait until I got sworn in yesterday before I had those conversations. Uh, there's new leadership there. They've inherited a lot of these problems. I mean, you know, I go back as former mayor, they're in the San Bruno days, and there was a CEO, and then there was another one between that time, and now Geisha's there. Um, and, uh, you know, I think it matters. You know, on the flip side of that, someone could say, well, he's too familiar with them, so he lacks objectivity. I, you know, yeah, I, you know, I try to be objective about these things as much as I can. I'm a fiduciary to the people of the state of California. That's my role and responsibility to protect your interests, not PG&E's interests. But sometimes those interests may align, uh, and that's where this gets complicated. Uh, and so uh, I think uh, that that history uh, actually will advantage, I hope, ultimately a conclusion on this. Uh, and, well, I'll do the, and right after, just because he's going to kill me because uh, he's been trying to talk, talk but go right after. Oh, yeah, there, there is this. What is he saying? I haven't checked my Twitter feed. Um, so the general and I, we, we're, we, we, we've been having conversations. He's been having with my staff the last few weeks. Um, we had a brief conversation a few hours ago on this topic, and we are following up very shortly uh, because we will have a menu of, he's providing me a menu of options uh, in terms of, what can be done, what should be done, what's appropriate, what would be inappropriate, what was our commitment under the executive order Governor Brown signed, uh, how's the remuneration work, what exactly uh, is the work currently being done versus the work that was initiated when the executive order was into place. And based upon the fact that we have militarized a large portion of our border over the course of the last six months, uh, and pursuant to what I imagine may come out tonight as it relates to possibility of emergency declaration uh, that will allow me uh, the ability to assess that changing condition and, and then make a determination. But I can assure you uh, I have not deviated from my previous statements in terms of my desire to move in a different direction uh, and hope we'll be able to make an announcement on that sooner than later. Would you like a pre-spawn to a potential emergency? I, uh, you know, don't, I'm, Governor Brown said don't respond to hypotheticals or at least engage in them. So I'm, that's the one lesson I learned as his yeah, lieutenant governor. Uh, yeah, yeah. So I'm still a little confused about all the numbers that were Yeah, I know. I, well, that's, I'm sorry to do that uh, to you. Is the $305 million in addition to the $200 million? No, that's part of it. So that's part of it. And, there's, there's, and the number where, where you're going to get confused. And the budget, the budget's going to be out in 45 days, is, is the number in the budget book, which is 415. But there's a reason for that, and, and, and that's a more technical reason, because that carries over money that you guys reported on last year. And that goes to the frame of your question. But the bottom line is $305 million of new investments in this space uh, that I'll be asking the legislature to approve. Uh, and I laid out some of the specifics that are is additional money or new money that was not part of the budget in the past. Some of it was a continuation of previous investments that were one time last year, and I'm doing one time investments into the new year. Uh, but 305 million is a good number for you to work off of. Is the 911 fee something that would be tacked onto my phone? Yeah, the 911 fee is something that we are not we are, we are proposing to enact, but not in the near term. I do not anticipate that the legislature will act on that uh, before 2020, meaning I believe the fee will go into effect in 2020. Uh, now, the budget that I'm submitting does not include a fee. It includes capital investment in lieu of a fee to get started to start building out our system. And that is 10 million uh, this year, 50 that I anticipate putting in next year's budget, and then the fee 
will replace the need for any capital appropriations and any general fund appropriations. And that is what we are going to lay out in our budget book as the framework uh, that requires two-thirds vote from the California legislature. And that is a vote that is unlikely to occur in this legislative session. And I can express and explain to you why at another time. Uh, but I'm not delaying uh, this. I want to make sure we're making capital investments today. It's, it's a mod it will be a, a relatively modest. By the way, this is old news. There was an effort last year in the legislature to do the fee. We're just building off the framework. So you can go back to your old clips on this uh, and you can get the details. Uh, look, no one, the last thing anyone wants to do is you know, come up on, at a time when I'm about to announce an interesting surplus that will be a little more interesting than the one you've been reading about or writing about. Uh, I don't think it's the right time to be talking about uh, a new fee. Uh, that say, said, it would be wrong of me not to invest in the, uh, the, the imperative that is investing in our 911 system. And that's why I will use some of that surplus and the general fund to make a down payment on that uh, until the conditions present themselves where I could convince two thirds of my colleagues or two thirds of the legislature to, uh, to do the fee. Thank you all. Thank you, guys.